It's that time of the year. Your vacation is coming up. You can already hear the beach waves, feel the warm breeze, relax, and think about work. You really, really want it all to work out while you're away. Monday.com gives you and the team that peace of mind. When all work is on one platform and everyone's in sync, things just flow. Wherever you are, tap the banner to go to Monday.com. This episode is sponsored by Skechers, the comfort technology company. I have a seven-year-old son, and the biggest mountain I climb every day is trying to put shoes on this child. And... I'm so grateful to Skechers for supporting this podcast, but also for making the only shoes my son will willingly put on by himself. Their slip-ons are amazing. Thank you, Skechers, for everything. And you can find Skechers everywhere. Skechers.com, a Skechers store, or wherever stylish footwear is sold. You know, I was going to marry a Martian that was below the Sierra Desert. So I grew up between New Orleans and Lafayette. My mom and I would drive back and forth a bunch. You know, half my family's in New Orleans, half is in Lafayette. And uh, in between those two is Baton Rouge. And I don't know what happened to my mom (laughs) in Baton Rouge, but the only time during that whole road trip where she insisted that, you know, us kids put on our seatbelts was in Baton Rouge. And she'd always be like, all right, buckle up. This is the crazy people town. So we always knew Baton Rouge as the place where crazy people lived. And uh, one time we were making that trip and sure enough, we had to stop for gas in crazy people town. So we pull over, get to the gas station and wouldn't you know it, (laughs) my mom's pumping gas. And then around the corner comes some crackhead pushing a shopping cart full of like microwave ovens and like a fishing pole and probably a kitten or two not a tooth in his head just screaming you know fuck this fuck that just angry at the world and letting everybody know about it and uh my mom you know just kind of kept her head down like i could see her rolling her eyes and like paid for the gas got in the car and like tore out of there but i remember asking her i'm like mom what was like what was wrong with that guy why was he so angry like what what was that she thought about a minute she was like well there's only so many souls in this world and you know a long time ago there weren't so many people around and so everybody got one soul a complete soul but as uh, the world became more and more populated there's a limited number of souls to go around and so they got diluted And, and some people in the world they only have half of a soul Sometimes less than that. And uh, that guy, yeah, he got he got shorted. I'm Scott Campbell. This is the Stupid Things for Love podcast. And today I'm hanging out with Fiona Dorif. The next tattoo is on a woman named Fiona Dorif. She's a really cool actor, does a lot of horror stuff. We set up an appointment for her tattoo and and she came in and she I was like, what do you want to get? And she brought in this business card and it was this old business card from like the 70s or 80s and it was like that heavy card stock with like the frayed corners and it had that, that thick kind of shiny ink that they used to use, you know, where you, you can feel it. And it feels like this kind of plastic text on top. Anyway, there was a really cool logo on it that was an eye with these lines coming out of it. And she's like, I want that. It's the logo of a company that my mom started, you know, when she was a kid. And it was a big part of her childhood. I was like, oh, that's so cool. And the the company was called SciTech, like P-S-Y-T-E-C-H. And I was like, what did your mom do? This is a really ambiguous but fascinating looking business card. She was like, well, uh, she did remote viewing. And I was like, great, what's remote viewing? And uh, it apparently, I'm not an expert on it, so I'm just giving you my impression of it. And if I get it wrong, please excuse me, Fiona and any remote viewing enthusiasts. 
it's a sort of meditation where you transport your awareness to places where your body isn't. So you'll meditate in your house, but project your awareness to anywhere in the world or beyond the world. And you kind of gather impressions and information from these places. And her mom did this for the government, for the Pentagon. Like she had a Department of Defense contract to gather information psychically from wherever they were interested in. And (laughs) that opened up a whole lot of questions. Hey. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm good. How are you? I was like 7.45, no. (laughs) Hey, thank you for doing this. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what we're doing yet, but you're welcome. Um, Uh, So, yeah, what's the best way to go about it? I mean... I guess I just wanted to get a sense of what you wanted it to represent and what you wanted to kind of abstract or distort. Like, what are you trying to move towards and what are you trying to get away from? I think I think no pictures, right? I don't want, like, the image. Right. I don't want a lot of ink either. I mean, if anything, I want... I want to keep it light and delicate. I mean, I, yeah. Really delicate, yeah. yeah. If there's a way in which we can center part of it, elongate it into my forearm so it's a little more centered, but maybe that's not the thing to do, actually. If it's... If it goes down and up my arm, even into the inside of my bicep, yeah, maybe that, but also just not wide long. There's two ways to do it. One is to elongate just one side of it or add art or script at the center of my forearm and then elongate the top and the bottom just a little bit, right? Okay, yeah. But I wouldn't know how to make that look cohesive. That's my job. Uh, I'll figure out how to make it look good. I I like the idea of figuring out some way to kind of whether we it's like her literal name spelled out in a way that kind of like embraces what you have. Or maybe it's something a little more kind of abstracted version of her name that kind of frames or holds that. I want you to look at it and be like, fuck, yeah, that's my mom. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Cool. Uh, You will come back to an email from me. Thank you so much. And have a good time. You're the best. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. I like the space that it's in. Right. Remember, it was like a last minute decision. Right. If it works along with where it is on my arm a little bit more. Right. So in adding to it, we start here and move this way. Yeah. But also, I think that... Go up and down vertically. Yeah, I, something about it being like along my... Where's the sketch? Because um, you had also extended this guy up. Yeah. It's kind of elegant to kind of extend it exactly. up and down. You know, I exactly. like that. But it feels like it needs to be here also, as opposed to just elongating there, and then that part is shorter. It it would be interesting to have it be symmetrically up and down. But there is that version where we talked about, you know, like I said, like the the kind of shading coming off of it, which could be, you know, it it would make it off-center enough that it wouldn't feel like a crucifix. Which would be just these two. Right. That's that's how we avoid the crucifix, is we just have it go up and down. On this side. On this side. Yeah. Right, okay. I trust you. I'm also particularly bad at imagining design if you know what i mean it's like just it's just not my well that's great because that's the only thing i'm good at (laughs) (laughs) literally the only trick i have so this will work out great yeah no the only thing that i (laughs) i don't want to do is like just the amount of like podcasts they're like Tell me what it was like growing up with Chucky. I'm like, I just can't do this anymore. Oh, like, well, I'm I not that. doing it anymore. I literally, I mean, I knew you for like <laughs> six months. And after like the third like child's play meme sending on Instagram, I like <laughs> caught myself. I remember texting me like, oh, wait, everyone <laughs> no, in your life does this, don't they? And no, you're like, I, yeah. I sent you something. I was like, just so you know, 20,000 other people <laughs> just sent me, me that. Meme. Yeah, I know. I was like, fuck, I'm another one of those. <laughs> I mean, it's like, I I don't actually take it personally because it's just like, oh, I know a person that's that, that's that just, thing. You know, it's like not a, it's, it's nobody means any, it's, it's yeah, weird. Like this it's is like, relevant. To so, I yeah. mean, it is crazy, <laughs> but that's, yeah, I mean, you're a part of this 
giant Zeitgeist like yeah. cultural yeah. like pop culture like Dang. icon it's gonna come up but, but at least like we think of you every time we see it <laughs> <laughs> it's also such a funny image to be like oh fiona yeah this killer maimed doll you know like, my father first of all is the voice of chucky and uh, so you know from like 1988 on he had a long illustrious career before then but uh, Chucky was just a phenomenon. Like that first movie was just a huge hit. So it was like a big deal in my high school. But your dad's also like. My dad's cool. Your dad's so cool. My dad's really cool. But I just, I, it, can I say that without taking away from the fact that like you're incredibly like awesome and relevant on your own? Because I'm always self conscious because people are like, oh, that's such and such as like daughter, daughter or yeah. such and such yeah, yeah, as yeah, yeah, son. Yeah, yeah. And like, you are Fiona in my world. <laughs> like I just want to acknowledge that like you are a freestanding awesome person. <laughs> Thank you. But like, if, if, and if I can say your dad's cool without taking away from that, I'd like to say your dad's really cool. No, my dad's really cool. Also, my dad is like the least Hollywood person you've ever Dude, seen one flew over life. the cuckoo's nest. Yeah. Like, child's play, whatever, but like one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Also, he did John Huston movies, which were amazing. I mean, he was he's like an alien to uh, both on screen and, and a little bit off. Really? Yeah. Yeah, he's like a hermit. He's... um. He's the least Hollywood person in the world, even though I realized I was raised around it. But like, you would never know. Never know. I mean, isn't that the dream though? I mean, isn't that we're all, I mean, that's why I'm in fucking doing my song and dance so I can like get enough money to buy a cabin somewhere and just like <laughs> be a has-been. Yeah. Like has-been is what we all are hoping, aspiring for. Uh, we will all get there. I can't wait you. to be a has-been. <laughs> he also loves it. I mean, it like drives his girlfriend a little bit crazy, but he, um, He's like, I want to be old, and I want to sit in this house in Woodstock that I was born in, by the way. Wow. And uh, I want to dig holes in the backyard and play video games. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. People come in the tattoo shop all the time. You know, and like so many times that's a question where they're like, but what's it going to look like when I'm old? I'm like, here's the good part about being old. You don't, don't have give to a give a fuck. <laughs> You don't care. Like, have you ever met an eighty-year-old that gave a shit about their arms? No. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna draw on this, and then we can decide. Like, I'm just drawing pictures. I don't know. This is just an exploratory exercise. I like the idea of the ashes. This is kind of like radiating out, but I feel like with the ashes thing, it needs to have like a direction. Yes. You know, like it needs to be. Well, I thought it was direction. blowing that way, but maybe if it blows that way. Yeah, but then we're gonna lose kind of the straightness of those. Yeah, the you he said the right word with elegance. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Kroger, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make shopping Kroger worth it every time. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. Save on O'Reilly Brake Parts Cleaner. Get two cans of O'Reilly Brake Parts Cleaner for just $8. Valid in-store only at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. You want to talk about Chucky? <laughs> no, I don't, want to talk, I don't want to talk about Chucky. But that was, that was, but that was part of like, you know, it's like, okay, so like, yeah, every fucking interview you do, they're like, your dad, your dad, your dad. Yeah. And, but then, and I knew that, like, like, you know, you've talked about your dad a lot. And obviously, I mean, obviously, it's also because you and he are both in the same business. We're, well, yeah, no. Um, You're both it's, actors. It's a, yeah, nepotism is a complicated thing, right? It's very real, and I have benefited from it, right? So I didn't, like, move to Los Angeles from Nebraska. You know, I was I was given a real opportunity. Right. Um, and I had, I had worked a good amount before I was cast in Child's Play. But basically, I've been around it my whole life. And then I was cast in the first movie as the lead. And I had no idea what Child's Play fans were really. Like, I, you know, I don't really have a relationship to it like that. And then I realized it's this, like, global phenomenon. And then the TV show is popular. Yeah. And then when I was 12, my mother left my father for a man named Major Ed Dames, who brought this symbol that we're 
who were tattooing onto my arm. <laughs> he taught remote viewing for a living. Okay, so yeah, so maybe that's context as well. So like... What the fuck is remote viewing? No, or just like, what is the tattoo I'm doing on your arm? Because I, I mean, I tattooed it. So you brought this to me. You're like, oh, this is my mom's logo. Yeah. It was the most meaningful thing in her life, a big part I of her think. Life. I actually think she left my dad, not for love, but for like the meaning that um, remote viewing brought to her life. Another bit of context, the reason why I'm getting this tattoo on my arm is because I had like a really close friend for, I don't know, seven years or something. And something about, something psychic came up and I mentioned remote viewing and he had no idea what it was. I was like, wow, I don't know, that bothered me. Uh, it's really? just some, Yeah, it's just something that I, I feel like I can't, I can't talk about. And I don't talk about it with this tattoo either, which is why I got it in a hidden place. But I was like, I need a, a recognition that, just for myself, that it didn't happen in a vacuum. Yeah. So anyway, remote viewing, my, my mother left my dad for this um, man named Major Ed Dames. He was in the military and he was one of three other people people who were part of basically this program that investigated whether parapsychology was real. Uh, so it started at Stanford in the 70s where they would do these double blind, um, double blind experiments with people who were known to be psychic just to see if it worked. Um, the most famous psychic was this guy named Ingo Swan. Um, and it was very inconclusive at best, but it was interesting enough to the government that they did fund an experiment that lasted, I think, like 20 years. It was declassified in 1994. Ed, my old stepdad, was one of the four people who developed it. And basically, it's this idea that anybody can get information from the collective unconscious about, like, where the bomb is in Russia, like, where the submarine is. And it's just like a set of protocols that you learn how to do with a pen and a piece of paper alone in a room. And so you get two sets of four random numbers. They're written on a sealed envelope. They're read out to you. And then everybody leaves the room and you go through these, the set of protocols. I started doing it when I was like 13. Um, and my mother really believed in it and taught it. And so did Ed. And it was interesting. I have really confused. <laughs> I have a very confused like feelings around it. I wouldn't say that it totally works. I wouldn't say that there isn't anything there either. Everybody who did it for a living got nobody ended up okay. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I think it. I mean, imagine living your life thinking that you can know anything and you are the most evolved of everybody who exists. And like, it, they got really paranoid. Like, I wasn't allowed to open the mail. The Unabomber was after us. That we, um, when I tell these stories, they just make it sound, I just have to remind myself that it was all true. But like... But do you think that's, that's a product of like remote viewing itself and kind of like being in that headspace or just a product of like being a secret government contractor for 20 years? You know what I mean? Like, it, I feel like, even if you were mopping the floors of the Pentagon for 20 years and couldn't talk about the stuff you see, you're going to be paranoid about the mail. Interesting. Man. Yeah, yeah. I actually never thought of that. I mean, the reason all of the ideas around the Unabomber and, you know, I was going to marry a Martian that was below the Sierra Desert, a hybrid, all of it, it sounds like it's just like people throwing out things, but each idea came from remote viewing sessions that they would do. And so it was all careful in their world and confirmed in their world. So imagine being like, I can tell you exactly what's going to happen. I can tell you who's going to win the Super Bowl. I can tell you, you know. And then when it didn't work out, I don't know what they did with that. It was a cognitive dissonance. Um, but I think it's insidious. Yeah, right. I think it, I think it, it leaves... It leaves you in an in a place where it is you're 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 too special. What is your belief on psychic stuff? On psychic stuff, my job has been to render symbols that are meaningful to people, and I have seen 
those things affect people in ways that are more significant than you would expect. Like, I don't believe in God, but I do believe in prayer. You mm-hmm. know, like, like I, yeah, like I believe in focusing on something. And I believe, you know, it's like obviously having a severed rabbit's foot in your pocket doesn't change the way the world reacts to you. But, but you believing that that rabbit's foot, right. you know what I mean? Like makes you lucky, changes the way you receive the world. And, and you do become luckier because of that. Um, so I believe in belief. But not necessarily, you know, and you could you could attach that belief to anything. That yeah, there there's something about the mysterious thing that I think our brains have not evolved to be able to comprehend. That I think that maybe 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 remote viewing maybe maybe it tapped into it. I feel good about check it out in the mirror. See what you think over there. I think it's cool. Does it get crucifixy? No. I just have to be careful not to bring the bottom down too much. Like I think Even I would, the shape of it I think is I mean it is a cross. It is a that's the problem. You know what I mean? Like it it, it is a cross. So it's um but I think making it's, it asymmetrical, you know, pulls it away from that. I agree. And also I think that because the dots are a different color right now, the cross is a little bit more pronounced than if right because you all see the same that color. separate yeah. from from what it was. Yeah, I'm I'm good with it. I, I mean, think it's cool. There's you know like, like it's also it's also just I mean it's definitely better, which I know you're not you're gonna hate that word. No, it's fine. <laughs> if, if you feel it's better, then it's better. Like you are the only audience that matters. It's true, and it's not too tattooy. You're not like oh that's a girl with a tattoo. Is I okay that adjective? <laughs> I, I don't know. Like, it's yeah, it's not relatable. <laughs> yeah, I, my whole world is tattooed. Literally, everything I do is tattooed. Your childhood is fascinating. It's int- it, I think I think it's interesting. It felt like it happened in a vacuum. <laughs> there's there's like a few sentences that I could throw out that were real, but sometimes now you're just like, did that happen? Like my mother and the people that worked for her became convinced that the narrative was so clear. There was going to be solar flares that were going to dry up all the fresh water on Earth. And we spent every holiday, we would go to Hawaii three times a year and walk around with this satellite device. And they would like be remote viewing and then we would walk around like all these really not vacation places in Hawaii. <laughs> right. Like a field in the middle of Honolulu. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they would they would be like, this is where the gray aliens are going to pick us up. And they were looking for this underwater spout so that we would survive. And then they found it. It was underwater by this cave and they bought land there and they shipped guns. Wow. And then I left. So that's when it sounds kind of culty. All of that happened. <laughs> I just have to. And and also my mother was magical and there was nobody who was there besides me and her. My sister bailed. So I wanted some recognition that it happened on <laughs> my arm. I mean, it's I mean, yeah, <laughs> she's also your mom. She's my mom. And she was, you wonderful. know, yeah. And she was a good mom. And that there's like warmth and connection, like relevance to you that is different where it's like, okay, socially, like it might be this thing, but it gets, pulls away from the fact where you're like, yeah, but I love my mom and she's not around and I miss her. Yeah. Yeah. My mom would have, um, my mom would always go to bat for me. How old were you when you're, you're in the dead mom's club? Yes. She died when I was 15. Oh, wow. Uh, That's hard. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's always hard. I mean, I had, that's harder. I really had what I believe to be the best version of losing a mom because she was, she was sick for a long time. She had cancer for like eight years. So she was diagnosed when I was seven. So it was like, we had so much time. She was in and out of chemo. And, you know, I I remember she was in bed for most of my childhood. And, you know, we talked about a lot. She was like, oh, this is what, you know, like, it might look like if I'm not around, you know, and she she was always very mindful of like telling us things that she wanted us to know in case she was, you know, she was like, oh, like, this is a great book. You know, I remember she like, and she leaned, she leaned a bit hippie. Uh, like, I remember she signed us up for TM as soon as we were old enough, you know, because TM, Transcendental Meditation, has this, like, lifetime membership. So she's like, oh, I can give you this. You know, I can sign you up for this meditation, and you you can have that even when I'm not around. But, yeah, when she passed away, you know, she was just banged up. Like, she had had so many surgeries, and yeah. and her body, I mean, she looked like Frankenstein by the end of it. Like, I remember 
it was a, like a Saturday and she called my sister and I to the hospital and she just said she wanted to go, you know, and you could see like she had tumors behind her eyes that were preventing her from really focusing. And she was just, she was so exhausted and like even talking was labored. She was like, I just she was like, I want to go. I just, I just need to know that you guys are going to be okay. And like me and my sister like hugged and we cried and like, you know, said, of course, you know, like we understand we'll be okay. And, um, and then we went to bed that night and got a call from the hospital the next morning, you know, that, that she had passed. But for a long time, I thought she just had incredible timing and was like intuitive. And then, you know, of course, later learned that, that she had been stockpiling her pain meds for like a month. And, you know, she decided that was her day. And she just like took a month's worth of pain meds that evening. There's a power in that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's funny. I like when, you know, that information was shared with me later on. You know, it was presented me as if there was like a layer of shame around it. And I was like, fuck, yeah. You know, what I mean, like, like, I get it. You know, what I mean, like, I, mm -hmm. you know, like, I mean, there's a part of me that was like, I wish I had given her permission sooner. You know what I mean? Because I'm, I, yeah. you know, what I mean, like, I could feel she was just hanging on for us. But did you feel anything after she died? In you mean some immediately? Way? Immediately know. after she died or not your own grief, but like something else? I don't know. I mean, it was 15. It was so it's such a big event that it's, you know, sometimes it's hard to distinguish what really happened from like the narrative that we have to hold on to right. through that stuff. I mean, I remember them coming in to tell me and it's like, I know why you're here. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I could hear it in the gravity of their voice. And I mean, I'm kind of like classic Southern guy, you know, like I don't, I don't kind of, I'm not very outward about pain or hurting, you know, I'm just like, well, I'll crawl under the porch and come out when I feel better. You know, like I, I don't, so I, I remember just kind of like, being like, okay, got it. And yeah, I remember going to school on Monday morning after that and like walking into that building feeling like bulletproof. You know, there was something mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. like she died and then the next morning, like I was a man. And I remember going into that building and just watching like high school life unfold around me and being like, all the shit you people are worried about means nothing. You know, like, like yeah. the perspective that I had, I really felt taller and kind of like stronger because of it. But, uh, but yeah, I, you know, like I feel really fortunate in that, like I got to have all those conversations with her and stuff. This stuff is going to happen to everybody. I knew my mom was going to die before she did. I remember I sat in a car with her and she pulled out this ring. My mom died with nothing. My mom, my mom, my mom had had, my mom had a psychotic break is basically what happened seven years before her death. And eventually it just, went down and down and down and became homeless. And I spent seven years trying to do whatever I could. And it was such a rough journey that nobody was willing to take it with me because you, you try to help somebody who's screaming at you. When you say rough journey, you mean taking care of her or trying just, to... Just having anything to do with it. Like right. there was nobody who was taking her calls at the end. My dad, my sister, nobody was willing to to even talk to me about it. Um, it was a very lonely experience. My mother also like, you know, she had in her mind, there was the mind control battalion was after her. And, and I just tried to send her money when I could put things in her books when she was arrested. Like it just all happened in a vacuum where it was just me, it, you know, and I, I would have boyfriends that'd be like, just don't answer the phone. And it's like, you, uh, imagine if it was your mom, you like you can't, you can't not, not take that fucking phone call. And part of, I think the tattoo was uh, the whole time. And I think this is a part of grief is I was just like, this happened. Like she, it happened. Uh, and I, I've, I've heard other people echo that because when somebody becomes that destitute and the world stops acknowledging it. And, you know, my mom eventually died um, of an overdose of heroin, meth, and fentanyl. And I mean, I, I couldn't even have a funeral for her. <laughs> like wow. nobody, like it just happened in a fucking vacuum. Do you have any opinions as to whether or not it was intentional or So accidental? no, I know the story. This is another thing. So the, she was living in this like kind of encampment thing and the encampment people got together in a park and they like, it was, there was something sweet about it. They like dumpster dived for bagels. And I, I went, <laughs> I went with my friend Liz. <laughs> the whole thing was unbelievably surreal and everybody was on drugs. 
everybody was telling me like what you think happened to your mom didn't happen to your mom and like uh, you know uh-huh. in these communities there's it's drug abuse or, or mental illness yeah it just is these aren't people who just can't find a job and a man came up and he sat down next to me and he had no shirt on he was like 60s and he looked very rough and he just started weeping openly and he said i'm so sorry i would never have wanted to do that to joni uh. not joni not joni and anyway, everyone wanted me to arrest this guy or get him press charges against him because I guess he injected her with the heroin and then got scared and left. That's uh, why she died. But also, my mom is suffering less than she would have. Yeah. It's just too heavy. Yeah. I mean, or it's not. I think everybody has their everybody has their story. So I have a question for you, Scott. Yeah. Did your do you think your childhood made you a caretaker in your adult life? A thousand percent. Yeah, I would say I so. therapy about it all the time. Yeah. That's my like in relationship stuff. The things that I try to like get by or it was interesting. So like after my mom died, you know, like anyway, I've I've gone to therapy about like patterns in my relationships as to why I I keep ending up in a situation where I'm like in a caretaking role to these people. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like I'll I'll date people that have really big personalities and I'm more comfortable being the kind of second fiddle, Muted you know? Him, yeah. And it's funny. I went to go see this therapist and immediately he was like, he's like, Oh, well, your mom was probably a narcissist. And I was like, you can't say that about my mom. You know, like no way. And I asked a bunch of her friends, you know, like I said, cause it's, it's hard for me to know what the reality was versus the narrative. Cause once somebody dies, everybody's like, they were an angel. Everything was great. And you're like, was it though? Anyway, the reality is, she wasn't a selfish person, but the the situation was very selfish. So like my whole childhood, I'm like taking care of like my source of unconditional love. So like when I Your meet source someone, of unconditional love that was disintegrating. I yeah, mean, it's but that's like, how like yeah. but literally I'll meet someone and I'll like have a crush on them, and I'm like, what problems do you have that I can fix? <laughs> You know, because, like, that's how I show affection. I'm like, I think you're really cool. Can I clean your house? Can I like wash your car? Like, what do you need? And um, you know, often. <laughs> At my own expense, you know, and it, it was you know, like, I remember the moment I like someone presented me the idea that generosity can be a form of self-destructiveness. And I was like, oh, that's me. A thousand percent. That's yeah. me. Ah, I'm just going to get used to this is the deal. Yeah. Because it doesn't, just it doesn't feel great. Big of a deal. It's fine. It's her ashes. Yeah. She was also cremated. <laughs> and I can't. Do, where, how was your, was your mom buried? No, she was cremated. She was cremated. We just, what did you do with the ashes? We planted a tree. Oh, very good. And then, you know, dug a hole and put her ashes in the hole and then put the tree on top of it. Okay. Have you, why do you still have her ashes? I just have them. Yeah. Just like a roommate? Yeah, exactly. I have a picture of her when she was 22 and then her ashes in a cupboard. Aw. I feel like. Spreading them is really useful because then it's like you don't have the responsibility of carrying them. You know, I, like I, you yeah, know, even you, just hear, like you hearing that they're in your cupboard the like makes me, makes me nervous. <laughs> I was like, God, what if you you switch housekeepers and they don't know? You know, I was like, <laughs> no, I know. I'm I'm also I'm um, lending my apartment to my little sister because I'm I'm going to be gone for a while and. Uh, I was like, heads up, like, my dead mother is right here in this urn. Right. She was like, okay. <laughs> right. She's like, this is sugar, this is flour, this is my mom. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, it's not it's not my mom, but it's um, whatever. But I mean, it's you know. it's still there as a symbol of her. So, it's, you know, it's like I said, like, symbols have whatever power we give them. So it's... Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I also have her ring, which is on the same arm. Would you do anything with her ashes or do you like having them around? What the fuck should I do with her ashes? Where do I put them? I don't know. You have whatever process or ceremony gives you closure. Yeah, I know. I know. If you have any, want to brainstorm some ideas, <laughs> <laughs> you can let me know. <laughs> I was trying to think of her favorite place, but I don't know what that is because it's all sort of tainted. I was going to say, if we talked about this sooner, I was like, oh, you should bring them in and we'll mix it in the ink for your tattoo. Shut the fuck up. Yeah. We can go back and do that over it if you want to. <laughs> no, I'm saying like even after this, if you're like, yeah, I want some of that juju in there, bring a little bit of her ashes and we'll we'll mix it in there. Mix it in. It's not gonna like give me an infection or something, is it? No, it's okay. just charcoal. I was trying to define, describe what tattooing. The deal is, if you focus on something, it 
it becomes intolerable. But if you don't, it's perfectly fine. You know what David Milch said that I remembered? He was like, you're, as a parent, you're the custodian and the child is the world's. Like the planet owns the kid, you're the, just the custodian. Oh yeah, yeah, totally. I think that's true though. What are you filling in? The white. Oh, okay. It's okay. I mean, it's- It's fine, I'm just it looks a baby. Pink now. It's, it's okay. Look, I am not here to give you a foot rub. <laughs> no. I'm not, so it's like, if, nope. if it doesn't feel good, I can still be doing a good job. That's true. I really want to see it. All right, here, let me wash you off and check it out. Mm. It's over. I mean, unless you want to do more. This is like treading lightly. And obviously, so the, the stuff they added today, a lot of it is a lighter tone than what was there before. So when it heals up, you know, it'll kind of fade. It, oh, cool. It looks darker and crisper because it's just fresher no. than the rest of it. Um, but yeah, check it out in the mirror there, see what you think. So the red is blood. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's no red in there at all. <laughs> That is your skin being pissed off. I'm excited off. to see what the white looks like. Where did you, you put the white in the middle? I like I did, around well, the, the little dot in the eye and then the around the, yeah. Oh, you put a dot in the eye. Yeah. You know, I have that dot. Yeah. In my actual eye. I grew up, you know, a little punk rock weirdo misfit kid in school who sat at the, at the lunchroom table with all the little goth kids and gay kids and skater kids and everybody got picked on or beat up or just felt like they didn't fit in. Um, but man, I think about Fiona and her reality as a kid. I mean, imagine going to school and hearing about what everyone's parents do for a living and you not being able to tell your story honestly because your mom has a Department of Defense contract, like a government contract with the Pentagon to psychically spy on the Kremlin. Um, I just don't know how anyone in that situation would ever be like, oh yeah, I fit in here, I'm one of you. Like, I think you would just always feel this sense of separation. And uh, anyway, um, thanks Fiona for hanging out. I'm, I'm in awe of the emotionally stable adult you have grown into especially given the the cards the cards you were dealt every day we rise challenging ourselves to work for what we believe in at US border patrol Protecting our borders is more than a job. It's a calling. Agents answer the call, working together to keep our country and communities safe. If you are ready for a new mission, join U.S. Border Patrol and go beyond. Learn more at cbp.gov careers.